Hello and welcome to part four of the seven dispensations. I hope to wrap this up with this uh, segment. And uh, I'd like to continue the thought that was going on in the last couple videos uh, about being the same gospel. And I want to start out in Galatians chapter 2. And we're going to be looking into uh, verses 6 through 10. And here's what it says. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrariwise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also am forward to do, was forward to do. Now, the gospel of the circumcision and the gospel of the uncircumcision is the same gospel. Um, there's a whole lot of people that get into this. To rightly divide the word of truth, um, there was a gospel that went to uh, the Jews and there was one that went to the Gentiles. No. That is absolutely not true. Look what Paul says here in verse 6. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. You see, Paul and Peter had the same gospel. So, what is the difference? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Now, Peter went to the circumcision, that is, to the Jews. Paul went to the Gentiles, or the uncircumcision. But now, it wasn't always that way, okay? Peter was told over in... And I'm doing this off the top of my head. Let's find it here. Let's see if I can find it. Acts chapter 10. Uh, remember, Peter had a vision uh, regarding going to a Gentile. And the Gentile is Cornelius. So he had a vision and it was these wild creeping beasts, unclean beasts, and verse 13 of chapter 10 says, And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Now, there is one gospel, there has always been one gospel, and there will always be one gospel. Paul uh, had a habit, if you notice, going through Acts, and I'm not going to go through every single thing. I'd encourage you to read the book of Acts. But you will see that at first, Peter went to the Jews first. He seeked out the Jews. Um, and whenever the Jews wouldn't have anything to do with him, he'd go to the Gentiles. Um, so, Peter, by and large, went with the circumcision, or the Jews. Paul, by and large, was the apostle to the Gentiles. But that's not to say that they were exclusive in that regard, because the gospel is still the gospel. Uh, a person could be a missionary and um, head to a country in Africa to preach the gospel, but perhaps two or three years later, they might go to Japan. You know, it's not a set in stone thing. 
they gave the gospel to people. And remember, in this dispensation, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Okay, we're all one in Christ. And to try to be splitting that up like that is foolish thinking. So, what is the difference? Why does it say gospel of the circumcision, gospel of the uncircumcision, if it's still the same gospel? Well, it's very simple. It depended on the audience. You see, the difference between the gospel of the circumcision and the gospel of the uncircumcision was not the message, but the destination. The message was the same, but who it was to was different. The approach was different as demonstrated by Paul when he spoke to Jews and when he spoke to Gentiles. What would be the difference? Well, if Paul were speaking to a Jew, they already had the knowledge of the Old Testament. They already had the knowledge of uh, the law. And so the approach to talk to them about the gospel would be somewhat different. But with a Gentile who did not have the knowledge of these things, um, he would take a different approach, just like he did in... Acts 17 on Mars Hill. It was an entirely different approach than he would say with a group of Jewish people. So that's what that's talking about. It, uh, the message, the, the gospel itself, that which saves people unto life eternal, it is the same gospel. Uh, it's only the destination that's different. Who it was going to and what manner it would be delivered. Um, you might share the gospel with a person from Japan slightly different than you would a person from South Africa. Um, Paul says, I have become all things to all men that I might win some to Christ. That's what he's talking about there. He's not talking about jumping into their sin or doing whatever it is they're doing um, to try to win them over like modern day church buildings have, have used that for. You know, let's get the people into our church building and have all these big programs. No, that's not what that's about. Um, the approach to people uh, needs to be tailor-made, okay? And that's why you have the guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit. Um, the fact of the matter is the gospel is always the same gospel. So, let's look at John 10. Verse 9. John 10, verse 9. It says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pastor. pasture. So any man. Why? Because it's the same gospel. Now, there's another thing floating around out there that says that the Great Commission in Matthew 28 is not for us today. Well, I got news for you, it is. Because this whole book is Jesus Christ. It's about Him, it is Him on ink and paper. And every single thing in one way or another has an application to us. The Gospel is the Gospel. I covered what Jesus said before in Matthew 26, I believe. Um, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. So, it's the same gospel. Now, let's look at Isaiah 45, 22. Isaiah 45, and 22. God says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. See? Same salvation. Every single dispensation, every man has the same need. He needs Jesus. And that's why I've addressed it in previous videos, and I'm not going to go into that right now. But to say there's no Jesus in the Old Testament is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, 
it is a picture of somebody who has no clue about what the Bible says. Now, let's look next at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country, from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. That's for all of us, folks. Yes, the Old Testament saints, the cross was veiled, but they looked forward to that sacrifice when the Messiah would die for their sins and they could be taken out of paradise and up to heaven. Now that ties in with Revelation 21. Revelation 21 and we're looking at verses 1 through 3. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven and prepared, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's all the saints of all seven dispensations together at the same time. This is at the end of the millennium. Uh, the judgment, the great white throne judgment has happened. All the righteous who got through the millennium, now they're given eternal glorified bodies. And all the saints are all together. And we are all the bride of Christ. All the saints. People need to step back and look at the big picture. Just like there are sons of God in every dispensation, it's also saints in every dispensation. That's a general term. Um, I've already done videos concerning the sons of God, so I'm not going to get into that right now. But uh, ultimately what it is, it is the perfect picture of the, the woman coming out of the man, yet the two are one flesh. And Genesis 2, 21 through 23, which shows we are in the body of Christ. You see... Old Testament saints are in Christ also, just like New Testament saints. Because this heavenly city that comes down are all the saints of God. All of us spiritually are married to God. Um, we are one with Him for all of eternity. People need to look at the big picture. Yes, there are certain aspects of uh, each dispensation that are unique. But uh, nonetheless... You need to step back and look at the entire picture and look at it from the eternal perspective. Now, uh, one more that I want to cover here before I go on to a couple other things is Romans 8. Romans 8. And let's look at verses 24 and 25. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Now this verse could easily be misapplied by some folks saying that because Jesus is present in the millennium, the people in their physical bodies are going to have to earn salvation through their works. This is absolutely ludicrous. That's not what that means. This is talking about us 
hoping for that new glorified eternal body. They're going to have the same hope in the millennium. Uh, I've showed in previous videos before this series that, that people still come to Jerusalem and they pray to Jesus and he's right there in front of them. So the hope is the hope that goes back to Job. Okay. Job 19 verses 25 through 27. And I think I've read that before, but let's look at it again. Job. Job 19. Twenty-five, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another. Though my reins be consumed within me. You see, that's the hope that we're talking about, folks. It's the hope of that glorified eternal body when forever we have left this flesh that uh, is dying. Um, that's exactly what that's talking about. It's not talking about uh, people trying to earn their salvation during the millennium. That's absolutely foolish. Now, next, let's look at another verse in John. You see, what I, the, the point that I want to make when it comes to true biblical salvation, it is not your works. Your works are filthy rags, okay? Who does the work? God does the work. God does all the work. You do zero of the work. Um, you can't clean up your life and fix it and turn it over to God. And you can't say, Lord, I want to be saved. And then after that, you know... I'm going to promise to go on missions to Africa and do this and that and the other. It doesn't work that way. You can't bribe God. You can't earn anything. All you can do is receive Him by faith. And the verse that I want to point out uh, is John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And verse 17. But Jesus answers them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. You see, Jesus did the work. He did the work on the cross. There is nothing you can do to earn it. Salvation is the, is the same in all seven dispensations. Go back to the garden, just like I discussed in the previous videos. Adam and Eve tried to work. They covered up their nakedness and shame with fig leaves. They sewed them together. They got busy working, working, working. Got themselves covered up. God said no. God had to reach down and save Adam and Eve. He did the work. He killed the animal. He covered their nakedness his way. And that's the problem with people. They don't want to do it God's way. They want to do it their own way. That's why this whole world is full, full of so many cults and false religions and people that claim to even be King James Bible believers, but they're really not because they're wolves in sheep's clothing. The fact of the matter is they want to do it their own way. Um, and don't get me wrong, there is absolutely nothing wrong with teaching a holy living after you're saved. Okay, where to walk in obedience. Um, of the and in, in, in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ but uh, we are to be guided by the Holy Spirit day by day minute by minute second by second and that's a whole other topic but I'm not going to get into that right now uh, next I want to cover a little bit about the life of Saul now Saul is very interesting um Let's go back to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. First of all, Saul was saved. Okay, We're going to go back first to uh, 1 Samuel 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. And... 
And first we're going to look at verse 6. And it says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. That's salvation. Let's look further. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. You see? He was saved. And all those signs came to pass that day. So we see that Saul got saved. Now, some people are going to say, well, the Spirit of the Lord left Saul, and when he did, he lost his salvation. Because that's what happened in the Old Testament. It was faith plus works, and if your works didn't get it, you're done for. That is a lie, and I'm going to show you from Scripture that's a lie. And Saul is the perfect illustration of the whole thing. Uh, one of the very best that I've seen in the Old Testament. There's some things about Saul that I want to show you um, that, that show that he was saved and that he did go to paradise and eventually on to heaven. Now, after disobedience, the Spirit leaves and he is rejected as king. Let's look at 1 Samuel 15, verse 26. 1 Samuel 15, 26. And it says, Now therefore, okay, I'm going to start in verse 25. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Now, Saul, he blew it. He lost the kingdom. He lost his kingship. Now, there is a prophecy uh, concerning him that we're going to get to in a minute. But I want you to remember that when Saul was killed, so were his three sons. One of his three sons was Jonathan. Now David, the Bible says that, that um, David and uh, Jonathan, their souls were like knit together. Let's look at 1 Samuel 18. 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 3. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. You think that David would have loved a wicked, reprobate, unbeliever? No. But he loved Jonathan. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Now, uh, let's turn over to 2 Samuel real quick. I want to show you something over there. And after David had learned of the death of Jonathan, okay, he said in verse 25 of chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O Jonathan, thou wast slain in thy high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Notice he called him his brother, spiritual brother. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. See, David understood true spiritual love, which is greater than any physical love in this whole world. Uh, the spiritual love that we share with the Father for all of eternity when we're one in Christ. So, that shows that, that Jonathan went to paradise. They, they were spiritually brothers. Now, remember, they all died the same day. Okay? Now, I want to also point out something really wicked that Saul did, just to show that um, how, how bad Saul got. Turn over to 1 Samuel 22. 1 Samuel 22. And let's look at verse 18. And the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priests, and slew on that day fourscore and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. Saul ordered this Edomite dog to kill 85 of God's priests. 
Now man would look at that and say, he lost his salvation. He went right straight to hell, that wicked soul. Well, fortunately, <laughs> we don't have to draw any false conclusions because we got the word of Samuel, the prophet of God. So, the Bible says over in uh, 1 Samuel 15, 35, Samuel 15, 35, it says, And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Now that kind of puzzled me for a long time until I really got to study in this. Nevertheless, nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. So, we have Samuel not seeing Saul anymore until the day of his death. Whose death? Saul's death. You see, on the day of Saul's death, he saw Samuel again. Let's look over in um, chapter 28 of 1 Samuel. And let's look at verse 8. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring him, bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. So they went to go uh, to a medium and call up a familiar spirit. And the person that Samuel wanted to, I mean, Saul wanted to see was Samuel. Because God wasn't talking to him anymore. So, now here's where you get into some stuff if you're into um, a false religion like Seventh-day Adventism. They teach that because, well, they have to teach it this way because they believe in soul sleep. Um, but they teach that Samuel here was really a demon. Now that's their words, not mine. I use the word devil. But... The, the person that I heard teaching this on his uh, Seventh-day Adventist broadcast one time was saying, that wasn't really Samuel, that was a demon. Uh, no, that was really Samuel. So it's not very wise to be calling God a liar because God says it was Samuel. Furthermore, Samuel made a prophecy, see? Um, he says, let me see. 28 19 Moreover the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me the Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines now a Jewish day runs from sundown until sundown so he went there he came at night the Bible says, back in verse 8, And they came to the woman by night. Now the very next day, they got up, and um, they had the battle, and he died. So, I'm going to have to continue this in another video, because my battery is just about dead. But, um, thank you for listening, and I'm going to pick this up in part 5.